G'day, my name's Dave, one of the consultants in the Reach Australia Network, and you've pressed play on the special episode of a Reach Australia podcast where we are going to be talking buildings together. If you've ever sat in your church building and you've wondered, what more could we possibly do here? Or perhaps you felt the building is full uh, or you've longed for a more permanent location, this is the episode for you. Uh, and I'm joined today by Andrew Robson, uh, who is going to help us think all things building. Uh, so welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here. Now, we've asked Andrew to come along because uh, you've had some wide-ranging experience uh, hanging out with churches and doing buildings. Uh, you were involved at Springwood in the Lower Blue Mountains as they did a build. I, w I watched that one. You yep. watched that one happen, yep. Uh, and also you had a coordinating role at EV Church on the Central Coast uh, and there was two buildings that you were involved with there. And, and, and uh, acquisition of land, Ac yep. Yep. Um, and uh, you had a similar role at St Paul's at Carlingford, so northwest suburbs of Sydney, uh, again, in, in a role there where we worked together um, and I saw the magic happen um, from, uh, from close, close up. And you're here now, you're at Northlight Anglican, um, but you're also on the Growth Corporation board. Do you want to just quickly say something about that? Yeah, yeah, the, the Anglican Church Growth Corporation has, has just been formed. It's a Sydney diocese thing. Yep. It's designed uh, for the diocese to focus resources and energy and money uh, on developing uh, churches in new areas and yeah. also redeveloping churches in areas where there, there needs to be kind of a repotting and a re rebuilding yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's recognizing that we need to work together and, uh, and, yeah. and and seeking to do that better yeah so Andrew comes with great experience and this has been a, an area too that as we've consulted with lots of different churches around Australia lots of people are thinking into this space uh, and so I'm keen to learn and to sort of understand and uh, be as helpful as we possibly can uh, as part of Reach Australia as we think into this complex space um, because there's lots for us to think through uh, as we think together. And so the way in which we're going to uh, work our way through is uh, we're going to talk some general principles up front and then we're going to talk about before you build, during the build and what happens after. So let's jump in to a couple of general principles to start with. Uh, and the first one that uh, you often speak about is that every church build is different. I mean, aren't we just all building just big boxes? Like, what, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's a few ways of coming at it. W one way that we're different uh, is uh, there's, a, there's a big dividing line, and we'll talk about this, it, between whether you've got land or whether you don't have land. Okay. That's a big step and a big difference because obviously you can't build a building unless you've got land. Yeah. So land comes first and that's a complex story. Yes. Um, the land you've got, so EV is a good example of that. The, the land that we had there, we realized pretty quickly after the first build wasn't enough to do what we wanted to do. So we needed to acquire more land. Yeah. So the land piece is quite significant. And I know there's lots of churches that are in rented accommodation, all that kind of thing, and, and all around Australia. And um, uh, so, so there's, a, there's a piece there. Yep. Um, the other side of it is the, every church is different in the sense that the nature of the, the, the church organism that yeah. in, inhabits the building, yep. the current building and the building you want to build, determines what you're going to do. And uh, another way of thinking about it too is buildings are tailored to their site and their community. And I think it's very helpful to think of a church building less like a block of units of the same value and more like um, a, a production facility yeah. of the same value. So instead of thinking about, let, let's say it's a $5 million build, a, a five, it, it's much more complex than a $5 million block of units. Yeah. It's more like a $5 million um, production line to make scientific equipment. By which I mean, it's relatively simple to build a block of units, and the market will clear it for you. Yep. So if if you have to if you have to change halfway through, and all of a sudden three of the units need to have one and a half bedrooms, there's actually a market for units with one and a half bedrooms. Yeah. Okay. And and the market will clear it for you. But with a church, 
if you get halfway through and you need to change something quite substantial, yep. that could actually invalidate the whole build. Yeah. That could turn the building into a white elephant. It could be just like that production line all of a sudden can't build the thing that it was designed to build. Yeah, so this is the second principle, uh, general principle, in that as we think about doing church buildings, you're like, yes, first principle, everywhere is different. But the second one, in terms of getting into the nuts and bolts, the second principle is, it's just, you're not just building a big box, you're just building something with four walls. Um, and this is sort of where you're starting to go with yeah, this yeah, that's second right. that's general right. principle. So the, the, the four walls thing, while, while that's often true, so Carlingford, for example, um, the building we built at Carlingford, we, we, we went, uh, we, we realised we needed to build a whole new main auditorium. Yeah. We built a 500 um, seat auditorium, which largely was a big box. Yeah. Um, but the key is, it's not just the big box, as we know with the church. So yeah. you build that bigger box, you, you, it needs to be comfortable, it needs to work. Yeah. People need to be able to flow through it and out of it, and the building needs to reload again. The children's ministries that are yeah. implied by, children and youth ministries that are implied by a, a, a 500 seat auditorium, there's yeah. no point building a 500 seat auditorium if you've got nowhere for the kids to go. Yeah. Um, for that kind of size of, uh, of silly. So if you're building a, a 500 seat yeah. auditorium, that implies that you're going to need toilets for that many people. Yes. You're gonna need kitchen facilities for that many people. You're gonna need milling space for that many people. Yeah. You're gonna to need to work out where those people go when the next service is coming in. Yes. Uh, you're gonna need children facili children's facilities for that many people, or at least yeah. get close to it. Uh, staffing, those people are, staffing facilities. Staffing facilities, you're gonna need offices and you're yeah. gonna need all that for, for that kind of facility. You're gonna need um, a car parking for, for all those people. So yeah. all of those things um, are implied yeah. in, in what you build. So it's not as simple as just building a box. And actually in most cases, councils will force you to think through those issues. Yes. Um, if, if not actually, um, th they will apply algorithms to the floor space of your main meeting room yes. and tell you that therefore, if you're going to build that, uh, you're going to need this many car spots yes. uh, and, and you know, things like that kick on. You're going to have to think about how the, how the car park works with the roads around. Uh, you, you might need approval from uh, the, the, the roads authority or, or the local council, depending on who, mm. what kind of road you're on. Yep. Yep. All these knock-on effects. Yeah. And so, there's, yeah. so th that's where we, we, we say it, it's not just a box and also every, every build is different. Yeah. Um, so it's important to understand the complexity of the design process. Yep. And, and I, yep. think, I think that's a very important step. Yeah, okay. So we've got now, we've got our two sort of general principles. You know, every church build is unique and different. Uh, we've got that second principle that you're not just building a big box. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's more production line and just sort of trying to think through the complexities and knock on effects. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to start to dig into, you know, the, the, I guess, what's sort of actually happening. And we're going to talk before what you do before the build, what you do during, and what you do after. Now, heads up, there is a disproportion of you know, a number of things we need to do before. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking through what happens before you build, um, because in some ways, you know, what happens during is you build the building that, you know, the architects and you've sort of worked yeah. all up. So you, you pay, you're paying a builder to build the building that, that you've designed with the architect and you've got approved through council yeah. and, yep. In a sense, although there's some some issues to manage there, largely at that point you, you pay professionals to do the rest of it. Yeah. So for churches, the real power yeah. of, of building buildings is the, the lead up process. That's okay. where that's where you can influence yeah. things and that's where you will succeed or fail. Okay. So let's start jumping into this before and what's Give us just maybe an overarching idea of what's the process. You know, take us through the steps and then let's jump in and unpack some of them together. Yep, so um, as we said, there's a land issue. Yep. Um, so you, you need to work out what land have you got? Uh, how can you get land? Is the land you've got enough? Yep. Um, uh, do you need to sell that and buy something else? Do you need to buy more land? Do you need to buy land in the first place? So obviously that's a first step and that's a big and complex topic yeah. on its own. Yep. Um, the next step is if, if you've got land, you need to work out what your ministry plan is. Mm. What are you doing? 
Yeah. And so it's interesting with the Growth Corporation, we've got a screen that we put over the, the churches that we partner with. Yep. Um, and and, and the, f the first step is show us your mission plan. Yeah. Show us what your plan is for what you're doing, where you're going, how you're going to reach the community with the gospel. Yeah. Um, because if you don't know that, mm. A, what are you building for anyway? Uh, yeah. B, it, it will be very hard to raise money. Yep. And C, what are you going to build, yeah. actually? If you don't know what you're doing, you, going back to that first point, you're not going to be able to work out what kind of building to build. Yep. So there's a, a big question about the, the why. What are you doing? How's your ministry work? Yeah. How stable is your ministry? Is it growing? All yep. of that. Yep. Yep. Once you, if you do have that stable, if you've got land and you've got a stable ministry plan, yep. uh, the next step is to develop a design concept. Yep. So think, well, what do we want to build? So that's where you need to get architects involved yep. and work out <clears throat> what you can do yeah. um, with yeah. the site you've got. So um, a, a friend of mine is an architect said, and I think he's right, and I've observed him a few times, um, yep. that church buildings tend to design themselves to an extent. Yes. Once you put all the constraints in place, all the rules yep. in place, what yep. kind of land you've got, what kind of ministry plan you've got, the, the building kind of... 80% yes. comes yeah. together. You, you yeah. already know, well, we can't go bigger than this. We can't go higher than this. Yep. We know how many people we've got. Um, we know how many car parks we could possibly jam yeah. onto the site. Yep. So you, you start sort of working out, well, there's, there's a parameter there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get a design concept together. That's when the, the architects really add value if they can understand your ministry and then yes. th they can apply th that understanding of the ministry to the 80% yep. obvious. Yeah to get you to 90%. Yes. Now, once you're at sort of, I mean, I'm talking generalities here, but once you're yeah. at about 90% of you, you kind of get, yeah, that's the kind of building we want to build. That's when you start exploring with council. Yep. Um, most councils have uh, what's called a pre-DA process. So you yep. can go in and chat with council, yep. show them your, your sketch ideas. This is kind of what we're thinking. Yep. What do you think? And they'll usually, most councils are, are positive at that stage. They'll, yep. they'll certainly be saying, yep. yeah, look, you know, that, that looks okay. You're going to have to think about this. Did you think about this? You know, yep. often the, the, the flies in the ottoman are often um, parking, road interface yes. and um, stormwater detention. Yes. So that's what we had it coming for. We had to yeah. do gigantic underground caverns what about for stormwater detention. Trees, environment? Trees and environment, sort of yeah, they'll, they'll give you a, well. bit of a, a bit of a sense there. My sense is most churches, maybe outside of inner city settings, most mm -hmm. churches will actually want to do what the council requires, if not more, in terms of greening the site. Yep. We want shade trees we want yeah. gardens that look yeah. good we yeah. want because we're building a facility that's our own we're not is it different to property developers where they're wanting to develop every possible legal square inch yeah. and yeah. up to sort of a hundred thousand feet yes they want to build yeah. yeah we don't want to do that we want to make a nice site that works mm. and so we um we, we kind of um we'll want we'll, we and, and i think it's, it's helpful to express that to council that we, we really want council to understand that we probably want to do it more than they do. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, there's all those kind of things. So you talk to council, you take in their feedback, the architect works that up a bit more. Then you go into um, a process of um, uh, d developing that plan into a form that could be submitted as a DA. Yep. So a DA, a good way of thinking about a DA development application yep. with your local council is the development application is the council says to you, Yes, you can build that kind of building. Okay. It's largely boxy. Yeah. If you can imagine, um, if, if you can imagine in a 3D model sense, yep. what, a, what a council would do with a DA is say, um, it'll be a series of polystyrene boxes that just join together. That, that's what you can build with that shape, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. After you get your DA approved, you then move into what's called the construction certificate phase. So before, when you've got a DA, before you start construction, you have to get a construction certificate. Yep. The construction certificate is um, a certificate that says, but from a planner, either a, 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 a planning consultant or, a, or the council that says, um, the, the detailed plan that you've got now yes. is okay to build. Okay. Yeah. So, so the DA will say, you're gonna build this box. The, the construction certificate is given at the end of a process where you say, so this box is going to be held up with these kind of walls, with these kind of beams inside, with these kind of fittings. It'll look like this, it'll be this colour, it'll be... And 
that, that process is also the bedrock of the tender documents that you give to builders yes. to say, we want to build this thing, yeah. how much are you going to charge us to build it? So you have to then move, once you've got construction certificate or around there, you then move to give to um, a builder a, a set of documents to say, how much would you charge to build this? Yes. Um, and then there's a whole other um, bit of uh, yeah, okay. argy-bargy in that process. And again, that, that's quite a bit of work. Yep. Once you select a builder and get it all teed up, you sign the contract, yep. that's the end of phase one. Okay. Phase two is then managing the build, build. process. Okay, so let's pause there and let's um, uh, go back and dive just a, a few more details in, into those uh, particular steps. Um, so one of the one of the first pieces you spoke about uh, was the why you're building. Um, is there any more sort of detail? I guess you want to sort of help us understand in that very initial sort of step. Let's you know probably just put the land acquisition just to the side for the time being, and let's start thinking about what why do you want to build? Like, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things we need to be wary of? Or what's helpful to to know in this space? Yeah. So some of those principles, the town planning principles, I guess, that I described, help govern the process a bit. Yep. So one thing, people will say, well, I want to build the biggest thing I could possibly build. In most cases, that will be smaller than you think yep. um, because of the parking requirements and that kind of thing. But I, I can imagine there might be some churches in some parts of Australia where they've got lots of land and the biggest thing you can possibly build is not necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, you've got to think into uh, what, what are you doing? What's your growth path? Yes. Um, very important. Um, to, is to think about what are the steps actually. So for example, you're, if you're in a building that has, um, you've got maybe three congregations of 100, yep. and you're gonna build a building that seats 300, um, the process, we'll talk about this in a minute, but the yep. process takes a, a fair bit of time. Yes. So what, what, how's your church gonna grow between now and occupying the new building? Mm. What's going to happen during building when you can't occupy the site yeah. you're on? Yeah. Um, where are you going to go? Yeah. What are you going to do? Um, how, are each how is each congregation going to keep growing? Yeah. And what happens when you move into the building? Are you going to combine? Yeah. Are you going to just keep each one growing in the new space? Yeah. Um, there is a reality <clears throat> that um, we're all familiar, many of us will be familiar with the 80% rule, yeah. um, where you or a church organically will not grow to more than 80% of its, it, it, its seating capacity. Yep. You can force it, a yep. funeral, um, you can merge two congregations, yep. but pretty quickly they'll devolve back to, in ongoing weekly yeah. operations, they'll devolve back to the 80%. I don't know what the rule is, but there's also a lower end. Uh, if, if, you, if you move yeah. a congregation of 100 people who are crowded into a room that seats 120, yep. you move them into a, 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 an auditorium of 500, it will feel pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and that can kill you. Yeah. Um, Cause all of a sudden people are going, oh, I don't like this. So when, when we're, we're thinking in this why build space, um, there's, there's a danger I can start to see that you, you start to touch on of, um, you know, perhaps we've got a growth, you know, we've got a growth trajectory. We've got our mission plan all set. And if you don't, here's up for a consult. We'd love to help you figure out your mission plan. But, there's a danger, isn't there, about going, our vision of where we want to go is the building. Yep. Um, help us unpack what's, what's some of the dangers in that space. Yeah, so that's why starting with the mission plans, right. The building helps you yep. to do your mission. Yes. The church is not the building. The church is the human organism, the spiritual organism yep. within yeah. The, the, the building yep. and so it, you've got to focus on the, 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 the that sense of what the church is and the building serves that yeah. um, and, and so having having a good sense of, of, of where you're going um, helps you to focus on growing the people yes. more than the building because um, you know th th there's you, you most people would have heard the the old thing you know if, if you build it they will come yep. um, there is mild truth to that, actually, but it's it's not a strategy on its no, own. No. Um, I, I would say, though, just as an aside, if you don't build it, they can't come. So yeah, if, okay. if you're already okay. maxed out on your site, yep. if there's nowhere to sit when a visitor comes to church, yeah, okay. then they won't join you. Yeah. Uh, this is the reality of how that works. So so th th there is a truth in that. But, but yes, you, you need to understand 
your church in its in a spiritual uh, and human organism yep. and and have the building serve yep. that don't get it confused okay yep uh, so we're here we're, we're in doing a deep dive at the moment into the before aspect of uh when it comes to buildings uh we've looked at the why we've unpacked a little bit of the process we've seen some general principles but now if we've got our why sorted uh, surely one of the key questions we need to talk about is how do we afford this? Uh, how do we raise the money in order to build this you know, great thing that we'd like to do that's going to uh, have a building that helps us build disciples? Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are some of the things we need to be aware of in this space? Yeah. Um, so obviously, yes, affording the building is very important. Yes. Um, I, when I was a kid, I used to... Um, I used to do a lot of rock climbing. I grew up in the Blue Mountains and I, I didn't have any ropes or anything. Um, my parents thought that wasn't a good idea. So yeah. I just used to climb without ropes. So one of, my, one of my, my principles as a teenager in climbing was I'd always climb and then make sure I could climb back down again before I went further. So I didn't want to get stuck up like a cat up a tree. Yep. Buildings are like that. So you, you want to edge in and, 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 and keep, keep getting to sort of safe points where you can opt out. Yep. Um, and so it's very important that you, you, you be thinking about money. One of the important things, strangely enough, is that you don't raise the money too early. Yeah. So let me try and explain. Um, when you're doing that, that process we just talked about, so you're trying to come up with a plan for what kind of building are we going to build? Yep. You've got an architect helping you. Yep. Um, I, I should say too, um, I, I hope this is not offensive to anybody, my advice is never use the architect in your own congregation. Keep the architect in your own congregation on your building committee. Yes. Pay a, an external architect. Yes. It's, it's a cousin of that, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the lawyer who acts for himself as a fool as a client. Yes. Um, it's okay. that kind of thing. You, you, yes. want, you want to keep some, some distance and so that they're, they're a commercial arrangement. Yeah. But the architect will come in. The architect will give you some indication of, well, if you build that, it's going to cost roughly this. Yeah. Now, they will um, usually, in my experience, it'll, it, it'll come in under what it really will cost. Yes. And often, you know, there's some ludicrous early <laughs> estimates that, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so it, it will cost, it, most the buildings cost a lot of money in Australia, yep. Yep. everywhere. Um, the rules make it very expensive to build. It's a long time since the, the guys in use could just turn up and whack up a building on the weekend. Yep. Um, and so it, it, buildings cost a lot of money. So, but the first, interaction with cost will be the architect helping you to work out well to do this will cost this kind of money okay um and then also that, that's, that's that's back of the envelope kind of calculations of cost yep back of the envelope calculations of what money you can raise there's a couple of really easy yeah. rules around that yeah. Yeah. um first of all if you run a giving campaign yep. within church which we can we can talk about yep. um a well-run giving campaign, the rule of thumb is you will be able to raise two times your annual giving. Okay, so so you, you know, annual giving is normally half a million dollars. You're saying, you know, a good campaign will get you a million dollars. Yep. Um, that's a, a general campaign with your church. Yep. You may be able to access um, particular individuals who can perhaps give more and you, you, can, you can work that through. Mm -hmm. um, you may be able to access money uh, from your network. Yep. And, 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 you know, that, that may or may not be a possibility for you, whether it's your, your diocese, your, your, your denomination, uh, yep. other partner churches, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, and then the other part of it is um, borrowing. Okay. So, and this is where land comes back into it. So there's a couple of things with borrowing money, again, back of the envelope, rule of thumb sort of stuff. Um, Mostly, a few banks have a blanket ban on churches, so yep. you, you'll, I, I wouldn't say that you hear their names, but you, you'll pretty quickly work out once you get outside of the branch structure into, church lending always goes up to usually the state level in banks. Yep. Some of the banks have a black ban on churches because they've just been burned too many times, okay. um, but a few of the banks um, uh, will do it. They will tend to lend you less money than they would for a house. So the loan to valuation ratio, mm -hmm. um, rule of thumb is 50, 60%, not 95% like it might be for a house. Yep. And so if you've got a lot of land, 
that will mean you can borrow more money okay. in terms of what they will lend you. But yeah. they will also put a, a pretty fine tooth comb over your operations. Oh, yeah. the, ironically, the bank will be one of the most ardent observers of your mission plan. They yes. want to know what your plan is, what your staffing plan is, how you expect to grow, and they'll want to analyze your church as a financial system yes. and work out, they'll make their own assessment of how much they think you can pay back. Yes, yeah, so they want to know what, yeah, how much they want to be able to lend you and what you can afford and they'll put their eyes over it is yeah. what you're saying. And banks are very twitchy about lending to churches because, so they won't want you to get into trouble. They're very twitchy because they understand that they have um, impaired security. Mm -hmm. So if you're a a regular person with a house, you get into trouble, the bank will help you, but eventually they'll go, right, we've got to sell your house and get our money back. Yeah. They can't do that easily with a church. No. They, 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 they'll get their $5 million back, but they'll do $100 million of brand damage yes. by repossessing a church. They know that, yeah. which is why they're very twitchy with, with borrowing. Yeah. So what you, what you want to be doing in this early stage is you're getting a, a, a ballpark of what the building might cost. Yeah. You've got a ballpark of what money you can raise. You may have money um, in bank accounts already. There may be building reserves. Yep. Um, there may have been you know, a building sold years ago and the money was put into trust or something. There might be that money. Yep. And then the other piece is how much you can borrow. Yep. You put all that together and you're now getting a bit of a picture of yeah. what it's going to cost and what kind of money you can access. Okay. And is this thing going to work yeah, or so not? So what you're saying, you've got, here's the money we've got or we can raise or we can potentially borrow. Here's our back of the envelope what we think you know we need and you're starting to sort of yeah. see whether there's a marriage that can happen and those two need to start talking to each other so you need to say to the architect yep i know the 25 million dollar per house is a great idea but we <laughs> yeah, need to govern it down yeah. to three million yeah. that's that's kind of what yeah. we think we can deal with likewise you might be starting to say well look three million is the minimum to go ahead really yeah. but we can, we're going to see how we can raise two and a half yep. you then need to start saying well to get to there, we need to fix the $500,000 problem. How, where can we get that from yeah, and start working, yep. working out yep. what do you do? Does, it, does that mean you pause, you save furiously for a while? Yep. Um, and then come and, back and to then it. come back or what, what do you do? So, yeah. so they need to start talking to each other. It's an iterative process at yeah. that point. And so when uh, you know, you've sort of got those things and they sort of match up, you know, you've, you can know, build the building you can afford. Um, when do you actually activate this giving campaign in that sort of process? You said often churches go too early. Yep. You know, is it after you've got the construction certificate and it's out to tender with builds and you know, you've got a fixed price, is that when you go or is that too late? Yeah, like, that, that's too late, um, but you don't want to go too early. So yep. what I was just describing, that early process, you're already spending money. Yeah. You've already got an architect yeah. involved. Yep. Now, you might be able to do the very first bits with your own people, but very quickly you need a, uh, yeah. an architect who, who's, who's sort of not you to start giving you realistic and independent advice. Yep. That costs money. Yep. Um, Are there consultants at this point? There, there may well be. Um, there's an argument, um, which is correct, but there's variations on a theme, that you should get a project manager involved yes. pretty early on. Yep. Because project managers will bring a different set of skills. They were actually involving a builder at that stage too. Mm -hmm. A building consultant mm -hmm. can help too because architects will have a very general sense of cost. Yeah. The builders will start to move in and, and give you more of a, a, a more more of an accurate sense of cost. Yeah. But that can that can, they can they can ramp up later in the process. Those guys. Yeah. But what what I'm saying is, as you move towards a DA, you're already spending money. Yeah. Putting in a DA and getting an approval yep. for the building costs quite a bit of money. To put in a DA, you need something like, I think like 20 consultants. Yep. So each one of them, you know, some of them will, will charge, it will end up costing you 30, 40,000. Some of them will cost you two yep. or three. Yep. You know, engineering, civil engineering, structural engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, yep. architects. On and, and on they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And You've got to get can you've got to get some element of consulting from from those guys, um, not all of them, and sometimes you can minimise at that point, yep. and and you can put in a low spec DA mm. um, rather than a high spec DA. You, yep. you can put in literally just a box largely for for a DA approval, yep. so you can minimise it up to that point. So what I would recommend is you you, you have a two stage process. Mm. The first stage is you need to raise money a few hundred thousand dollars yep. um, from your own 
people and it's largely your insiders. This isn't the time for the big giving campaign. So at Carlingford, we ran a dinner. Yeah. Uh, we actually did it at EV as well. We ran, we ran dinners and we, we, we invited, um, we, we actually invited everybody, but we particularly focused on people who tended to be, um, who, who had the capacity to give and, and, to, and had that kind of mind that mm -hmm. said, no, I understand yes. if you're gonna do a $3 million building, you need to spend a few hundred thousand dollars designing it. Yeah. And I know not everybody understands that. So I'm gonna give you $10,000 towards that yeah. process. Yeah. Nobody will ever see it, yeah. it, it it'll, it, you know, but, but it has to happen. Yeah. And, and you raise that kind of money early, mm -hmm. and then later on, and, and later on you do the, the bigger thing with everybody. everybody yep. The bigger thing with everybody, the giving campaign with everybody, I think you should, personally, I don't think you should do that before you get your DA, yep. because your DA tells you you can do it. Yeah. What if the council says no? What if they say no? And yep. you've raised all that money, and do you, you then got to give it back, or what do you do with it? Yep. Um, I, I would say you should give it back, actually. Yep. I think. I think raising the money provisionally when you we're not you're not quite there yet yeah. and saying to people if you give us money we will give it back if we don't build this thing so long as you tell us who you are yeah there's the issues in that yeah. but you do the giving you do the, the the development application you get the approval mm -hmm. i think you actually need to work into the construction certificate process where you get all the consultants involved yeah that's where you also definitely need a building consultant who says who says to the architect, yes, you could put the beams that way, but if you put them that way, you'll save half a million dollars. Yeah. The architect goes, oh yeah. yeah. It, often that's what the builder will know and the architect, it's just yeah. the different skill sets. Or even the particular materials the they materials use The materials they point. use, yeah, don't use brick, use preform, yeah. whatever it is. Um, the, um, I think you wanna be a fair way down the track Yep. of your des your detailed design process. So that construction, that's where you say, we're gonna have doors made of, you know, machined walnut from London or, you know. <laughs> doors uh, plus. Doors plus doors or, th that's where you pick all that stuff which really add up to cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where too, there's a reality check on your cost estimate. Yes. So one of the things uh, that, that's difficult, the earlier you go out to everybody and say, we're gonna build a building, it's gonna cost $3 million. You then, you're six months down the track and the designers are saying, Actually, it's going to cost 3.8 million. Yeah. Um, that's harder than you to go back and say, look, yeah. um, we said three, we think it's actually closer to four now. Yep. It's better that you, you, you're you at a point of, we're pretty sure it's going to cost this much money before you ask for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just so, you know, orientate sort of where, where we, we are at this point. We're, we're still talking about how we raise this money. Uh, we've got that sort of process we talked about. You, you sort, of, sort of said there's some money to raise early to get the DA process going. Um, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars in there. And then this giving campaign, something to the wider whole church that sort of says, hey, you know, we want you to think about, you know, you're giving and you're giving to help us pull this building off so that we can make more disciples in ever increasing number. And you're saying after that DA process, so it's locked in uh, and we've got some sort of indicative, you know, uh, in indication of what the cost is actually going to be yeah. without waiting until it's completely locked in because it's it. too late. That's it. So, so you're, you're, and certainly you don't wait till the tender. Yeah. Um, th that, that's too late. I'll explain that in a sec. But um, certainly you, you mustn't go out until, I, I think, yeah. you mustn't go out until you've got your DA approved because you don't know whether you can build it or not. Yeah. Once the DA is approved, then you can, then you can go out. Talk, now, talk to us just sort of briefly, sorry, just in this giving campaign process of what you think the role of the senior minister is in this? Yep. Um, I think um, the senior minister needs to lead the, pro lead the church yeah. and therefore needs to lead the process of the building. Yep. Now that doesn't mean they, they, they do the, the, the tactical thing, yep. um, the actual on the ground every day haggling and pushing, but they need to be the leader of the process. They can't abdicate that to somebody else and just okay. step out and say, yeah, build me a building, I'll come back. Yeah, okay. I'm taking long service leave. Okay. You can't do that. The, 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 the senior minister needs to certainly be the one who is over and setting the, the ministry priority he ought to be the one, therefore, who's saying, well, this is the kind of building we need, or involved in that process of understanding what the building is. Yeah. Um, and I think he also needs to be the front of the, the pitch for money. Okay. And I think if you don't do that, I, I just think it how leadership works. Yeah. It just means people will go, eh, I'm not sure he's really is he on really board. Is he really behind this, yeah. or is it someone else's idea? Yeah, so he, he needs to be really on board with um, 
with the building and and understand it and drive it and push it. And if he doesn't, yeah. I just think at some point it'll break down. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the, mecha- the transmission mechanism for breakdown, if it doesn't break down earlier, will be you just won't raise enough money. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to the actual sort of, you know, details of the giving campaign, I think I you know, we just want to put out there and say, Come, come to us for the conversation on it because it's quite detailed at that point and we'd love to have that conversation with you and your church if you're at that particular point uh, of it rather than going in the nuts and bolts of yes. it now. Yes, reach out for help before you yes. even begin that process and, and hear what other people have done yeah. because um, there are some mistakes. The thermometer... You know what I'm talking about. That is a catastrophic mistake. On the wall, you know, here's the two million, and this week we're at, you know... 107,000. Yep, and, and next week we're at 107,500, yep. you know. And that, that just, that's just a disaster. So don't, don't go down that track. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's okay. a bit of thinking in that one. Yep. Okay, so we're still in this before section. As we said, there's a disproportionate amount of time really spent thinking about what happens before you start building. And we've touched a little bit on uh, dealing with local councils. Now, every local council is a little bit different. So generally speaking, what are some of the key issues we're gonna interact with in that space? So a local council is an arm of government. So you'll have elected officials, the councillors and the mayor, and you'll have the planning staff, which is the relevant part of council's permanent staff who are are part of it. The planning staff generally are town planners, and town planners come with a a worldview Mm -hmm. um, that they get taught at university. Um, And so one of the emerging trends is, it's, it's mildly stated, but it's an emerging trend that churches are an illegitimate use of land. Yeah. So uh, churches, the, the concept in our society that churches are an unalloyed good has gone and people, many people think churches are terrible. Yeah. And that comes, and, and so then when you decide you want to build a church in a street, the peop, many of the people in the street will say, and this would always happen, many of the people in the street will say, not in my street, not in my backyard, the NIMBY yeah. thing, yeah. they'll complain. What's happening, though, is increasingly their complaints are, are heard and understood and sympathised with in a way that yeah. it wouldn't have been in the past. They'd go, well, where, churches have to they just go somewhere and your street's it, bad yeah. luck. But now it's, oh, you yeah, know, and increasingly um, churches are being zoned out. Mm-hmm. So church as an authorised land use in a lot of yes. kinds of zonings yes. is, is actually being changed as zoning laws change increasingly or decreasingly church is one of the allowable uses in all kinds of different zoning classifications mm-hmm. so very important actually early on in that early process i talked about yeah. and and the architect will admit this is one of the first questions they'll ask is what is zone what is this land zoned for yep. and what are you allowed to build here yep. and and it's not a it's not a deal breaker if if, if it's not zoned to allow church mm. it's designed because church is now such a um controversial thing is designed to force it to go to a process where you apply to mo- modify the zoning uh, instrument yeah. to allow you to build a church yeah. which immediately gets you into the political level yes and the councillors have the ability to um, w- w- within some limits to um, push past the zoning rules yeah. and yeah. and the, the de- development plans development control plans and things like that and say no that's okay we can build it there yeah. or they can also block it um, yeah. and so Knowing who your local councillors are, knowing yep. what, what, what they think, knowing the mayor um, is very helpful. Mm. Um, I had one Greens councillor tell me once, and I thought this was quite interesting. He said, um, when I was talking about, oh, I thought you guys might have been opposed. And he said, no, no. He said, we can count, you know. Um, and I thought that, that's quite, quite an important insight. If you're building, a, if you're a church in a community... Yes. Generally, you're concentrated in that community. Yes. Okay. The political level of the council will understand that if they, in, a, in an unfair or illegitimate way, block you, 
that will have electoral consequences for them. Yeah. They know that. Yeah. And so, so you don't want to be too swayed by what the planners say. Understand that it, it almost inevitably will go to the political level. Yeah, okay. That's really helpful. Um, you know, and just sort of want to, you know, I guess, couple that in with as we deal with local councils. You know, we, we, we want to make sure our integrity shines through. Yeah, oh, and, and look, the, the, the other principle to say is, and I, this is my principle with nearly everything, is, is you, you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Yeah. So be nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like I said before, with the, with the, the green stuff, like we, with the, uh, the, the number of trees on the site, and yes, you've got to chop down that tree um, to build the building. But yeah, but we want to plant 20 more trees because yeah. we want, you know, yeah. and, and be nice, talk to them and, and, and don't go in adversarial. Yeah. Um, and, and some of that stuff I was talking about is quite structural rather than the individual person. Yeah. Most town planners I've met have been lovely. I think there's been yeah. one where I've thought that was difficult, but yeah. usually they're, they're really nice people and they, they want to help you. And, yeah. and so okay. I, I think be, be nice. Yeah, nice. Um, I, I want to talk about expectation management here. Um, there's a big one. Because uh, I, I think sometimes when we think about building buildings, we think if I start now, I could probably finish next year, like you know, yeah, that, next that's, Christmas is next always Christmas, you know, in before Christmas, so we can run Christmas service in our new building. How long is this whole thing supposed to take? Yeah, it, it takes a lot longer than you think. Yeah. Um, so you need to allow yourself enough time to do things properly. Yep. And also, there's just a reality about how long it takes. So, the, the that that first phase that I talked about, now that can take a while. Yeah. Because you, you, you have to, that iteration of backwards and forwards with what's our plan, yep. how much can we afford, what are we going to build, you might need to go around that for a, a few years even yeah. before you land on, yeah, we think this is our plan, okay. this is our staffing, this is the building we want to build, we think we can build it, and, and then you, you, you get into it. The DA process takes about six months, yep. minimum. Yeah. So if you say to the architect, right, we want to apply for DA, you're going to have a whole lot of meetings yeah. where you, you find out, because you don't want the architect or, or the, you will get a town planning consultant involved usually. You don't want them putting in an application for a building you don't want. Yeah, it's got to be right. Yeah. So as I said, it can be quite high, 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 um, uh, high level yeah. and not specified in great detail, but whatever you do specify needs to be correct. Because yes. if it's wrong, and inevitably yes. one of the, one of something will be wrong in your DA, yeah. um, you then have to go back and, and do a modification to your DA, which is another process yes. again. And cost money. And cost money and cost you time. Yes. But I, I've got to say, that or, I don't think I've ever seen a church building that hasn't had that. But you don't want to have 12 of them, you, you want to have one of them, or hopefully you want to have none. Yeah. But you, so you, you do your, your development application. So that's a minimum, absolute minimum of six months, um, you know, three, four months preparation, several months in council getting it approved. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and, and so th th there you've got six months. The, the construction certificate process, yes. um, you can roll straight into that once you've got your DA approved. Yep. But in reality, as I was saying before, you've actually got a fundraising step so you're not wanting, you don't want to spend, uh, the, the, the construction certificate on a $5 million building will cost you somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000 in consultants, maybe three hundred dollars actually, yeah. depending on the kind of building and the situation. Yeah. You don't want to spend $300,000 on detailed building design if you can't raise the money for the building. Yeah, that's right. So there's usually a, 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 a pause point there where you're starting to think, okay, we've got it approved, phew, actually, it, in, in the way it works, usually there's a few months of everybody collapses and, and mm. has a rest. Mm. Then you come back and go, okay, now we need to start doing detailed design work, getting to a point where we know how much it's going to cost. Yeah. Then we need to take a break from that, raise the money, yep. come back and finish the detailed design. Yep. Um, and so that, that, that process, I mean, a giving campaign will take you, I mean, some of this you can do at the same time, depending on your resourcing, yep. but a, a giving campaign will take you nine months to set up. Yes. Um, it, it, the, the sharp end of it is about two months, yeah. but you've got to put substantial prep work yeah. into it, raise teams to help you. Yep. Um, the construction certificate process, you can race through that. Um, again, though, you shouldn't race through it too fast. Mm. There's like an intense phase where everybody's together, all the consultants are together, because they all, they all affect each other. So the mechanical engineers will want to put air conditioning plant on the roof and the structural engineer will say, well, you can't do that unless we strengthen the roof. 
and then the build will say, if you strengthen the roof, it's going to cost this much extra. Yeah. And so then you start saying, well, mechanical engineer, can't we put the air conditioner on the ground? He goes, oh, if you do that, and so, so you've got all these, that's what goes on in that, in that phase. So there's that intense phase. But then there's a run out phase afterwards where you, you're kind of bedding down all the detail. Yeah. So, so that's six, 12 months. So we're really talking, and this is, a, this is a good three to four year process. Yeah. From the moment it enters your mind at a you know, strategic staff planning, hey, we should, we should really think about building a building. Yeah. Uh, to actually being in a new building, you know, with new facilities and so on. Well, like, you know, we're talking, we're not talking a couple of years, we're talking more three, four, potentially a little yep. bit longer. And this is where the, the, the difference between the church and a block of flats comes in. Yeah. Because um, I remember we, when we were at, at Carlingford, there was a building we were looking at building and we, we were trying to work out like, how quick could we build this? Yeah. And I think I worked out it was about four and a half years. Yeah. And I said, a, a, and if we got a billionaire turn up and yeah. give us his checkbook and just say, spend my money boys, yep. we would still, I think it was still going to take three and a half years because it just takes that long to get the design right. If you rush it, you'll end up building a building that you'll go, what do we do that for? Because often these decisions we're making and building buildings, they, you know, they're, they're a legacy thing. Um, you know, the next generation is sort of stuck with what you, you've built them yep. and, and, you know, them going back, why do they do it like that? You know, yeah. or didn't they think about this? So they're, they're important decisions. Yeah, and I, I should say, actually, um, right back on that first in that first part, yep. there is a master planning element. Yes. So you need to think about um, often, not always, sometimes what you're doing is you're maximizing the site and at the end of this, there'll be nothing else to be done other than to bulldoze what you've just built in 50, 100 years time and build something else. But oftentimes what you're doing is you're building, you're affecting part of the site, but there's further development potential. Yeah. You need to kind of sketch out what that development what, potential what it could is. What all look like together. Because the obvious mistake is you spend a lot of money building something, yes. and then in five years you go, oh, now we need to build this, and you go, and you've oh no. You've blocked that growth corridor off with what you've just That's built. right, yeah. yeah. So you've got to, if you have that kind of site, you need to do some, some, some bigger planning as well. Yeah. And that there, that's another, that adds more time and, yeah. and effort into the process. Yeah. So you've got to think slow, careful, because we're not just building something that the market will clear. We're building something that we're going to be living with and doing ministry in this place yeah. for probably a hundred years with this building. Yeah, yeah, it's really helpful. Okay, last bit of the before. Uh, good on you for sticking with us. You know, there's a lot of detail in here and I hope it's really helpful. This is the last bit on the before is uh, where we're at that stage of raise the money, the builders are coming and we've got to think about where do we go. So any tips or things to think about planning off-site? Yep. Um, the first thing to say also touches on the previous bit as well, which is managing expectations. So we just talked about how much time it could take. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the old saying of um, under-promise and over-deliver. Yeah. Most ministers, because they've got soft hearts, will over-promise and under-deliver. They'll want to please people by saying, oh, it's only going to be two years. Yep. And it's actually going to be five. <laughs> so you've told them two and, yep. and it, it actually takes five years. Yeah. And so then there's expectation problems. Going, what, what happened? Are you, are you useless? You told us yeah. two years and now it's five. Yep. What, you, you tell them it's going to be five in the first place. That frames people's understanding. Especially true with the move off site. Yes. At a certain point, um, I mean, some, in some situations you can stay on site yep. and the building can be built around you, yep. but in many cases it's not that way, you've got to move out. Yeah. Um, that's an important part of your planning. Yeah. That actually could be a potential deal breaker. Yeah. Um, depending on how much it will cost and what options you've got in your area, yep. um, you, again, you've got, to keep, uh, you've got to keep an eye on the health of the church. Yeah. When, you, the, the, when you move your church out of its building into something else, if that something else is terrible, yep. too far away, yep. your actual church is going to start to, to decline. Yeah. And, and there, there's some inevitability about that, that yeah. you've got to go, okay, that, that's okay. But you don't want to get, you don't want to push that to a level of catastrophe. Mm. That also means you need to think about how long it will take. Yes. Um, you want to minimize it. So you don't want to move out too early, yep. but you also in the moving out process need to be helping the congregation uh, the congregations to understand yeah. 
yeah. that this could be a while. Yeah. And we need to get our heads into the mindset of we've all got to pull together to make this work. And mm. I, I, you know, reflecting on our time at Carlingford when, when we built there, you know, you were sort of going hard as a resource on the team, helping us, you know, coordinate that role with the building. And then we charge someone else, you know, we're talking about, you know, we have multiple congregations going all sorts of places, someone else to start to think where are all these places going to go so that, you know, the rest of the team can continue to focus on the health of the church. Now that's, you know, we were fairly well resourced in terms of trying to pull all that off, you know, and all our congregations pretty much ended up in different places. Yeah. And, so, and some around. of them weren't great. Uh, some of them were terrible. Particularly one of them, I remember, yeah. and our, our youth group um, was yeah. in a space that was pretty hard. Yeah. Like it was, um, it was a completely echoey space. Yep. So you get a group of, you know, what was it, 150 teenagers in a yep. room like that. Yep. It was painfully deafening and yeah, horrible. It, 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 it hurt, it hurt. Um, and they were so glad to get back into yeah. the building. Um, okay. Well, we're going to press pause there as we've dived deeply into what to do before you build. There's heaps of information. You may want to actually go back and listen to this episode again uh, in order to sort of just digest all that information. Uh, and why not think about uh, joining us for the Reach Australia National Conference? Uh, not only will you get some great information and really helpful for your ministry, but you get to see one of the buildings, multiple buildings that Andrew helped uh, design. And we'd love to be helping you and in consultation with you about how we can help uh, your ministry go forward in its physical capacity. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Join us for the next episode as we look at what you do during the build and what are some of the things you need to think about after. <laughs>